science, technology, and the future of the world. The first two things are very clear to me, science and technology, but the third part is a little complex for me, the future of the world. I would like to speak about the future of the world. This is something that you can always speak, but you, can, you are not sure of. Of course, future is something that you are not very sure of. You can only talk about the future, maybe tomorrow, few years from now. But what will happen to us many years from now is something very unpredictable. But let us start from a, an idea where we are. Because I am a space engineer, so I would like to start from the space. You know you are, you are on Earth, each one of you. You think the Earth is so huge and you are a person that is standing on the surface of Earth, and this Earth is rotating about the Sun, and we have the solar system, and the solar system itself is a part of the Milky Way galaxy, and you know there are so many stars, billions of stars, and this Sun is such an insignificant member of this solar system, and there are huge stars, you can't even compare with suns, and this solar system itself is at one farthest corner, one dark corner of this Milky Way galaxy, God-forsaken place. And this whole galaxy is so huge that the light takes from one end of the other to the other and takes millions of years to travel and reach. So it's such a massive structure called the Milky Way galaxy. And suppose you imagine that you are able to walk out of this Milky Way galaxy and then look at what is there beyond. What you are seeing again, the similar sky with plenty of stars. And they are not stars, they are again galaxies twinkling as single stars. So if you stand outside the Milky Way galaxy and look at the universe, that you are going to see again millions and billions of galaxies each of them bigger than the Milky Way galaxy itself. And the closest galaxy to Milky Way galaxy is so far away that the light takes millions and billions of years to reach our Earth. And if you're again going back and looking at the whole of this structure, what you are going to see is that the entire universe, any area you look at, even the emptiest space that you look at, is filled with galaxies. One of the recent pictures that the telescopes that we have put in space, you know many of the telescopes that you have put in space, including the Kepler and the Chandra, and they have been taking a lot of pictures of the universe. And one example is that one of the telescopes the Americans were put, they kept the telescope switched on for 10 continuous days into the darkest corner of the universe, where there was no light coming from, there were no stars, and they exposed the camera or the telescope for such a long time, and they got the image after 10 days of exposure, very steady and continuous exposure. And they developed the photograph and looked at it, and to their surprise, what they found is the entire photo image is filled with galaxies, which you cannot see because the light is so thin that it is not possible to be distinguished by the human eye. So when you look at the whole of this galaxy, uh, the universe, you are actually perplexed and you are wondering what exactly around us we do not know. And the type of understanding that you have today about the whole of the universe and the structure of the universe has come out of the single fact that we are able to go out of the Earth, put spacecrafts in the orbit of the Earth, and then look at the universe in much better clarity than we could ever do maybe 50 years back. Now, if you look at the Earth itself, you will wonder how this Earth has been created. Like, uh, no, you are students of physics, and you must be knowing the periodic table, 
and all those elements that are put in the periodic table. And all of you know, most of these elements are found on Earth. Did anybody ask the question how all these elements came to be in Earth at a given point of time in the history of this universe? Today we are living on Earth and all, most of those elements are present on Earth. How it ever happened? Why it is not made of gases? Why it is made of metallic materials, non-metallic materials and all those compositions that you can ever think of are present? How it did it really happen? One of the findings that recently, because of the space capability of the technology that we understood, is that the elements are created by stellar explosions. You know, in sun, hydrogen is joining together to form helium, and that has been going on for billions of years, and it will continue for maybe another five billion years. And when that is over, the sun is going to explode or going to become a dark, uh, what do you call the uh, neutron star or sometimes, I do not know the exact mass ratio that we have to see. But if the sun is, star is so huge, it will further collapse by reactions and the helium will form to form carbon. And if still heavier stars are you know, really forming, this carbon will form into other higher elements, higher Element, elemental forms. But if actually materials like iron or even copper or the type of materials that you know in the periodic table have to be formed, it can be formed only in stars which are so huge. And they are finally, at the end of the life, they are going to explode. Only then such elements can be formed. So you, you tell me if such elements are present in Earth, where it came from? The answer is very clear. It came from only explosion of stars. So all the element that is present on Earth were formed from those explosions? The answer is, it is so, and it is not from one explosion, from millions of explosions. And today we know the stars are colliding with each other, galaxies are, you know, they are in reacting or entering into each other without collisions, and stars are now colliding with each other, exploding. Every second this is happening all around the universe. And we people are unable to know that because our lifespan is so small. We, we stay here just for 100 years, maybe. And in that 100 years, the changes that you are able to distinguish or understand are so less that you don't see the events that are happening, the fantastic collisions and explosions and creations of those elements continuously happening in this universe are not known to us. And this is something that is known to the science today. And once the stars explode, the dust is thrown around the universe. And this dust of these elements and materials all around the universe come together to form another stars or another planets, and they finally give rise to something like Earth. And this is a story of how Earth is created. Today we know because of our ability to look at the universe, are there any planets like Earth around? And this is a fantastic finding that has come, and many of you may be knowing, they are called exosolar planets. And today we have almost 5,000 of exosolar planets found out using the telescopes and observational systems in space. Every star in this solar, you know, this Milky Way galaxy has got a planet, and this is a new finding. We thought planetary systems are not there in most of the stars, but now we know most of the stars contain planetary systems, and like Earth, there could be other Earths, and there could be other life forms present. One of the points that we need to understand when we talk about our future is how our present is created. Now, all of us know the Earth, when it was originally formed, it was not a habitable place. Maybe it was, it was melting, then it became solidified, it, it, it had no atmosphere to start with, then its atmosphere formed. But atmosphere was filled with carbon dioxide, and there was no ozone layer, and all the ultraviolet radiations were falling on Earth, and no life could sustain in such a condition. And there was no oxygen, and no life form could survive. But then there was a cyanobacteria that lived underneath the 
Earth system, and what it really did was a fantastic thing. The cyanobacteria could absorb the sun's light and convert or do the photosynthesis process. It takes carbon dioxide and water and produced oxygen. For billions of years, it produced oxygen. And the atmosphere of the Earth changed from a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere to an oxygen rich atmosphere. And today we have an atmosphere which is something around 18% oxygen. Suppose it, it is, you know, it is such a delicate balance today if it, the 18% became 20%, for example. Can we ever live here? Because oxygen is pure poison, all of you know. In excess, oxygen can be very dangerous. Everything will catch fire. Our metabolism will stop and will react to that. So we have reached a threshold of precise balance today where we people, like any other life form, could sustain and survive on the surface of Earth. So in the development of the history of the Earth, we are at a juncture in the last millions of years. Millions of years is nothing. It's only a fraction of a time in the history of the universe. So we are at that point in time in the history of the universe that we are able to stand and discuss how this universe is created. And, and really it is a fascinating story. Human being, a very highly developed form of life, has an ability to ask this question to itself. Who am I? Where I came from? What for I am here? These are the three fundamental questions that human being can ask to itself. And the whole of the discussion today on the future of the world and the spirituality comes out of these three questions. Who am I? Where from I came here? And what, I am, what for I am here? I don't know whether any other creature, any other life form that is existing on the surface of the earth can ask this question. And this is the ability of the human mind to ask this question to oneself. And I believe that the ability to ask this question is the game changer. And this is the reason. And this is the reason that we have discussions on spirituality, discussions on religion, discussions on science and the debates, trying to find out the answer for itself. The evolution of the human society or the history is a result of some of those people who ask this question. And as you know, Vivekananda once said, religions have been formed at many places. No, so many religions have been formed on this surface of earth. Each one came out of the particular situation in which it was formed and by, the, by its associations and its location of birth. And each of them making a progress in understanding those fundamental questions. And it has been come out of some of those people who had the light to see, light to understand what are the fundamentals of these questions. I won't go into the part of the spirituality now because that is not my area of work. My area of work continue to be science. But let me address something that can happen to us because we are today a multiracial, multilinguistic, multireligious group of people living on the surface of Earth, on the window, so narrow a window in the history of the universe, and talking about the future. I believe that we have one of the greatest power on command today to decide the future. What is that? If you ask me, one of the important ability is to, dis is to understand that the Earth has come to the state of existence for life to sustain is a result of the evolutionary process created by life forms that existed prior to our existence. So if you understand this very carefully, the cyanobacteria which lived billions of years back actually created an environment for you to become a reality. Unless the cyanobacteria worked for billions of years, the carbon dioxide would not have vanished, oxygen would not have come, and the cyanobacteria, the, the 
ability to photosynthesis, which is now present in plants and trees, could not have come, and hence the synthesis of hydrocarbon could not have been achieved, and hence be people like would not have ever lived. If I was a cyanobacteria at that time, assume my life, I compare with a cyanobacteria. When it lived, it would have lived for a few days. Did it ever realize that I am doing a work today which is actually building the future of the human which will evolve billions of years later? Did it ever realize? It will not, have, it will not realize that. And it is so for us. We do not realize that each of our work, each of our action, is the building block for the future. And this is the real message that one has to give to the society. The future is built by you people today. And your actions today decide how this society or this world will evolve millions of years from now. Now let us look at how it is going to happen. One of the important points today of discussion is the climate change and the ecological balance. All of you know that today Earth is such a fragile ecosystem in which the water, the air, the oxygen, the pollution, so many factors you know, control how life will sustain in the next million of years. I won't talk about hundreds of years because you will not be able to see the change in few years of time. But in millions of years, there will be drastic change in this ecosystem that can make life impossible. Are we doing something today to revert that change and bring back the situation on surface of Earth so that life can still sustain without any change, without any damage? Then you will ask the same question, Earth know how it, will, it has sustained till now and it will find its own way to correct and do to sustain it. And let us be not fools that Earth has no interest in you. Earth existed not because of you. Earth existed because Earth existed. Nothing more and nothing less. And you are such an insignificant creature on the surface of Earth. And this is something that we have to realize today. Unless you take care of the Earth today, it will not support you for millions of years. So this is one of the responsibility that we need to have. Another responsibility which I should discuss is about few last thousands of years, if you look at the history of the world, I would like to talk about three important points. One, food. Second is disease. And third is war. If you look at food, are you seeing anybody dying because of lack of food, poverty really around you? Are you seeing? There are people with poverty. There are lot, lakhs of people with poverty, but the level of poverty today is so less compared to that existed 500 years back. Or even just 100 years back. If you look at the example of uh, India, when, in, when the British were ruling us, millions were dying in Bengal due to famine. Probably at that time, newspaper, those who lived at that time may be knowing just because food grains are not available, people were dying, they were eating grass, and Bengal was one of the famine hit area. Today in India, we won't hear massive famine anywhere. Maybe definitely some people will be dying because of lack of food. If you look at entire globe, you will not see famine of those magnitude that existed 100 years back. It doesn't mean that famine has vanished or food grain production has increased in such a way it has come out because of one important reason, technology. Why in Bengal people died is not because there was no grains available. The grains from Britain came to the port of Mumbai, and to move the grains from Mumbai to Calcutta, it will take next two months at that time. And in two months, millions of people perished. Today, if in anywhere in the world there is a famine, I can tell you in a, in a day's time, food grains will reach because the type of transportation system, the, the awareness, the information passage that is available today is so, so powerful that it can reach. So nobody will die of famine just because there is a lack of grain, food grains, but only because there is a lack of logistics or poor planning. Otherwise, nobody will die in this world today. 
Second point is about the disease. All of you know, in Europe, just 100 years back, thousands were uh, kill, uh, no, dying because of plague. You know, it was a black, what is uh, that name? There was a black uh, punishment or something like that it was called. And people were simply dying in Africa. In US, yesterday they were telling because of fever, the rat fever which we talk about, in America, lakhs died once, 1960s. And, and the entire villages and cities were wiped out. In, actually, Paris was, 50% of the Parisians died just because of one disease, outbreak of a disease. Are we hearing anything like that today? We are hearing about rat, uh, rat fever and some hundreds of people die. But within one week or even two weeks, it is brought under control. It doesn't spread in such a way that it become a 50% of a village die, a 50% of a city die, and no cure. Today we know the technology has changed the way we handle disease, and the way in which we can handle disease has significantly improved. For example, look at AIDS. We have been talking about AIDS is going to wipe out the entire human race. This was the way it was being told once. What is happening to that today? AIDS disease rate increase in India has come down, actually. In the last few years, it has actually dropped significantly. It is not only in India, but also all around the world. It is only because that we have the technology to master it and control it. Now look at the third point, is war. Maybe a few hundred years back, there were kingdoms and kings and queens, and they were waging wars each other, and every kingdom wants to expand its boundaries Ashoka was fighting war, and Genghis Khan was coming down and killing lakhs of people, and, uh, and the, there was war of crosses between uh, the, in the entire Europe and the uh, Middle Asia. They were killing each other for thousands of years. Are we anybody killing uh, like that today? Is there any country invading another country to expand its boundaries today? Of course, there are some events of that nature happening here and there. You can see, if you go to West Asia, you see the story. You go to some part of this, uh, you know, some of the countries, it happens. But it doesn't happen on a global scale. People have understood the wars is of no use. And the type of death that is happening in wars have come down drastically. I am telling why these three important things is because the society is changing. Society is changing in such a way that we have understood significantly. And we need to maintain this for a very long time. What is the next goal of the human society? After conquering famine, after conquering disease, after conquering war, what do they want to conquer? They want to conquer death. This is the new finding. Human beings want to live forever. This is the future. You know our life, what is the average lifespan of an Indian today? It is more than 50 years. It was only 30 years, just 50 years back. And in last 50 years, average lifespan of an Indian has increased from 30 to 50 plus. And in the next 25 years, I can tell you, it is going to increase to 70 years or even more. That means the possibility of a child born in this country and its possibility that it may live till 70 years is going to increase substantially. And when it is going to happen not only in India, but it is going to happen the world over. When it happens, the, the whole globe is going to be filled with old age people. Youngsters will come, the you know, percentage will be less and older people percentage will be more. And those all older people are very active people. At a 60 years of age today, if you see a person, is not the person that you would have seen 100 years back, a 60-year-old fellow. The 60-year-old fellow today is much more active, energetic, productive, compared to the 60-year-old 100 years back. There are stories, people say, my grandfather was healthier than my, you know, I, me, many people say, but it is absolutely wrong. No, you have to do statistics to understand this. Here, say, it doesn't matter. There will be always exceptions of some grandfathers very strong at the age of 70, uh, but not all of them. But today, I don't see grandfathers at all. Even 60, 70 year people are working very effortlessly along with us in Nisro. 
Now, the need of the human society is to increase this lifespan to 100 years, 150 years, 200 years. Is it really going to happen? The technology predictions today say human beings are going to live for 200 years. They may live for 500 years. They may live for thousands, years, thousands of years. Is it really a possibility or I am just talking rubbish? It is, it is important to understand the science behind it. The science today is capable of extending your life beyond the possible deterioration levels of human body. You are aware of the ability to interconnect technology or sensors with human body. All of you, are, maybe some of your physics students may be able to understand the electrochemical reactions that are taking place in the brain in the form of signals can be captured by sensors. And if you can decode that signals and you can actually do certain work using actuators. There are helmets of that type. If you hear it, think about something. <coughs> you can get reactions on drives or actuators. Suppose there is a mechanism by which the entire computer data I am able to feed to my brain through the reverse process. Suppose I can electrically initiate my brain to absorb the data from the laptop and then store the data in my brain. Then you can imagine how wonderful it will be. You don't have to attend an MSc physics class. The entire you know, course material you load on a laptop, switch it on your, you know, you know, your helmet and uh, run the program and uh, that's it. You have already become an MSc physics graduate. Because the entire knowledge that is required to become a master student has been gathered in the form of information that is fed to your brain already. And you are already, you, you would have seen the English movie. You know the movie where this, this is done? Ten years back that movie was released, Matrix. Matrix movie, it actually shows that every person can be reprogrammed by running a program in a uh, computer system. And you simply reprogram it to become a pilot, you reprogram it to become a fighter or a racer, or whatever form you want, you will be reprogrammed. If it ever happens, the only thing that is required for a human being to remain human being is his brain. Everything else is dispensable. Your organs are dispensable. Your hand is dispensable. You can replace by the hand by another hand which will be available in the shop. Go and fix it. Once your heart deteriorates, replace it. Today, the electronics and mechanical system integrated into human physics is actually becoming a reality. And your hands can become a, an integrated system of sensors and actuators, which will be commanded directly by the brain. In fact, in VSSA, we are making one artificial limb. Your leg is cut off above the knee, and you can connect this item, and the sensory perception that is available at the end of the leg will be captured by sensors, and the actuators will move based on that you are thinking. You, you have to only think, and the sensor will act. So when you walk, you know, actually your legs are reacting to your thought process. So same thing will happen in electronically. It is possible to do. <coughs> that means one day, human beings will become a combination of machines and brain. And if you know how to sustain the brain for many years, actually you live for hundreds of years. You don't require your body to live. In ISRO, we know there is a program started recently called Human Space Flight Program. It was announced. Gaganyan program. And we are thinking of you know, moving, transporting human beings to space. It has always been a dichotomy of whether you should send human beings or a robot will do the job. Why a human being required to take the risk and travel to space? Why not a robot? This is a question that always asked. I believe a robot can do the job. Not today, maybe 50 years from now. It is possible to integrate a human being with a robot, with the technology that is coming up. I sit in a room and I can, I can do something with a robot based on the feedback from the robot directly. Suppose it has a camera and the vision that is available in the robot can be integrated to my sensory perception. And whatever he sees, I see. Because I don't have to have my eyes, light falling on my eyes to see it. Because just the electrical signal is good enough. 
and what he touches, I will feel, because its fingers are going to be wired to the sensory system of mine. And what he smell, I will smell. If that is going to happen, I can create my replica in the form of robots. And I can send the robot to space. And when we walk on the moon, I will be walking on the moon, because I will feel that I am walking on the moon. Finally, you know, everything in this human uh, life is nothing but experience. And experience is nothing but memories that are going to be hidden in your brain. So today you are attending this conference. And, to, and after one hour you will walk out of this hall. What is remaining in you is nothing but an image of what has happened in the last one hour. A memory that is written into your brain. And if I can give you the memory in the form of an information or a data, you are experienced. So it means if I have to ever travel to space and then experience an interplanetary travel, I don't have to travel anywhere. I simply sit in my room. I send the robot with the sensory perceptions which are connected to me through Wi-Fi. And I will experience it. This way, human beings' experience and life can be extended beyond the imagination of society today. And this is what is going to happen. And when all this happens, the questions of ethics and the right and wrong comes into our play. Even in every actions of human being, these are the two important questions always asked by the people who deal with the other side of science. What you do is ethically right, what you do is socially acceptable. Whatever I mentioned is not going to be available to most of us. And we all will die in 70 or 80 or 100 years. Only those people who have the ability to find money and resources and then correct yourself will live for 100 years. The society will divide into people, who, those who have an ability to live for 500 years, and people will die at the age of natural death. And the type of Social divide that is going to happen in the next hundreds of years are of this nature. It will not be religious. It will be purely based on technology access. Those of those countries who can access this technology will have the power. And those countries who doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the technology will die. And this is the social change that is going to happen. Now, I am not going to describe this as a possibility or a, or a prediction, but these are type of thought process that are available in different books and literatures and writings of various people. You are advised to read some of these books which have come out on this topic on the future of human society and the impact of technology on the evolution of the human society. I thought all of this when I, when, when I wanted to attend this seminar and to talk about linking my area of work of space technology and the evolution of science and technology and the future of human race. I believe this conference where very excellent lectures have been arranged from many leading people addressing the progress of science and technology linking to the future of human society. I believe all of you will think about it, not really listen and go away. As an individual, you have the right to create the future. Think that you are a cyanobacteria. It never realized when it existed how much impact it is making the future of Earth. Each one of you have the power to change and believe that today and you can make a small change in the thinking process, your actions, your work, your studies, your contribution to society. Make that small change. I think that is what is required and that only we can do. We are such an insignificant, no, no, nonsense fellows on the surface of Earth and we realize that very well. We are not important. We are so insignificant in the frame of things of this whole universe. And with humility and uh, the ability to contribute, I think we can make a big change in this world. Thank you so much.